Have you ever had someone ask you questions that were in the seesaw category? You don't know what seesaw category is? Where I ask you something where it makes me look better by making you look worse. You know, can never be equal, like a seesaw. One's up and one's down. You haven't had that? Well, if you have, what happened if you knew in your heart of hearts that you were right and you knew what was coming? Were you smug about it? Were you waiting for them to go, aha, and then you go, oh no? No. How do we act like that? How do we act in a situation like that? Hmm. If there were only someone who we should model. Hmm. Let's talk about that. Good morning. I'm going to start a little bit different this week. Um, I was reading uh, Matthew 21 verses 10 through 16 and it was looking at the stark contrast between the religious leaders and children. Have you ever been asked a question that you've been just stumped and you just didn't know the answer? Or someone was trying to ask you questions that they wanted to stump you, playing stump the chump or whatever. So the difference between last week and this week, when Jesus came in, in his triumphal entry, and everyone was praising him, except for the religious leaders, everything was fine. This week, the religious leaders were going to start asking him questions, trying to um, trip him up or whatever. But Jesus said that he valued their, the, the faith of the children more. It wasn't because that the children were innocent, because we know that all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, but it was because of their trust in him and their faith so we're going to go into this lesson let's go to god in prayer father god we come right now we just ask you that you would just watch over us and keep us we ask god that you would just open this lesson to us let us understand your word as you have it for us we ask your lord jesus that you would just be able to you would help us to be able to give a word whenever we have the opportunity arise that we'll be able to show someone the way to you. We thank you and we praise you. We pray for leadership in this nation. We pray for leadership locally. We pray for just everyone who has authority that they will submit to your authority. We just thank you and praise you. For it's in your name we pray, amen. Teacher, Moses wrote for us that if a man's brother dies and leaves a wife, but leaves no child, the man must take the widow and raise up offspring for his brother. There were seven brothers. The first took a wife, and when he died, left no offspring. And the second took her and died, leaving no offspring. And the third likewise, and the seven, left no offspring. Last of all, the woman also died. In the resurrection, when they rise again, whose wife will she be? For the seven had her as wife. Jesus says to them, Is this not the reason you are wrong? Because you know neither the scriptures nor the power of God? For when they rise from the dead, they neither marry nor are given in marriage, but are like angels in heaven. And as for the dead being raised, have you not read in the book of Moses, in the passage about the bush, how God spoke to him, saying, I am the God of Abraham, and the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. He is not God of the dead, but of the living. You are quite wrong. So, the Sadducees 
were a Jewish sect who were basically skeptical about the afterlife, about supernatural completely, which is really weird because they were teaching about God, but they didn't believe in the afterlife. They didn't believe any of that. And here Jesus comes and he's teaching exactly that about the resurrection and the life after death. So they had to trip him up. They said, okay. So then they asked him a question about that, the woman who was married to seven different husbands, seven different brothers. And their question was, okay, so tell me, who is she married to in this afterlife? That's gonna be a really hard family reunion. So they wanted to give him a dilemma that he would either have to denounce resurrection or admit that it would be odd. And Jesus was telling them, you're dead wrong, dead wrong. See what I did there? He was talking about, there is no marriage after that. It's all about worshiping God at that, at that point. Nothing else matters. Just think about it. Who wants to continue in this life? In heaven, there are so many other things that God has in store for us, even now. But the Sadducees were thinking, there is no more. Once you die, you're dead. And if you died and were reborn, the um, rose again, you just continue on. Jesus is like, that's not what it is going to be. Because the Bible already talks about there's going to be a new heaven and a new earth. But they were not really understanding that. They just wanted to try to trip Jesus up. So the Pharisees, back in Mark 10, verses 2 through 12, we're trying to trip Jesus up with the concept of divorce. And they were talking about um, basically in Deuteronomy where Moses talked about divorce. But Jesus went to them even farther back because Jesus is the word become flesh. And he went to Genesis to explain what Moses was actually talking about. So now the Sadducees are trying the same thing and they're trying to use that, that same thing to make the, to make the concept of afterlife seem ridiculous. And then Jesus goes back into Exodus and explains to them how it was already scripture and then shows them how they were wrong again. Those who were studying the scripture, they completely missed it. And one of the scribes came up and heard them disputing with one another and seeing that he answered them well, asked him, which commandment is the most important of all? Jesus answered, The most important is, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. And you shall have the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind and with all your strength. The second is, You shall love your neighbor as yourself. There is no other commandment greater than these. And the scribe said it to him, you are right, teacher. You have truly said that he is one, and there is no other beside him. And to love him with all your heart and with all your, with all the understanding and with all the strength, and and to love one's neighbor as oneself, is much more than all whole burnt offerings and sacrifices. And when Jesus saw that he answered wisely, he said to him, "You are not far from the kingdom of God." And after that, no one dared to ask him any more questions. So this next question, the topic of the most important law, 
was a hot topic, particularly for the scribes, because they wanted to make sure that they could get everything right. So if they got the most important ones right, then it'd be a lot easier for people to get it right and get into heaven, which makes no sense because that's working to get into heaven. And we can't. There's nothing we can do to make God love us more than he does already. And there's nothing we can do to make him not love us. So the nonsense of it was the fact that they tried to ask Jesus, okay, which is the most important one? And then he comes back and he quotes Deuteronomy 6, verses 4 and 5, where it says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord your God, he is one. Something to that extent. And it's talking about God is God. And then he goes into it and he says, Love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, and strength. And the next one is just like that. Love your neighbor as yourself. Setting the foundation for our Christian relationships. We don't do things to get God to like us. We don't do things to stay out of trouble. We don't do things to get God to love us. We do things because he loves us first. We do things because we love him. It's that relationship, not a try to get points or merits. That's not how it works. And Jesus was trying to explain that to them. There is nothing we can do. So the most important law was love the Lord your God. Know that he is God and love him. And if you love him, you'll love your neighbor as yourself. If you love your neighbor as yourself, you'll fall in line with all those others. It's not about a list of rules, but a covenant relationship between you and God. Jesus was teaching in the temple. He asked, How can the scribes say that the Messiah is the son of David? David himself says by the Holy Spirit, The Lord declared to my Lord, Sit at my right hand until I put your enemies under your feet. David himself calls him Lord. Then how can he be his son? And the large crowd was listening to him in delight. Okay, so by this time, the scribes and Pharisees and everyone else who was trying to trip Jesus up, they just gave up questioning because everything they threw at him, he turned it around and gave them scripture because he is the one true God and he is the truth. So then he comes back and he starts asking them, he asked them a question themselves and started asking him about if they even knew who the son of David was. They asked him about this whole thing about David because everyone around, this time was, it was the week, this questioning was going on the week leading up to Passover. So everyone was getting hyped up because of Passover and they were, really, really in tune with what was going on. And they had seen Jesus's triumphal entry and they had seen him cleansing the temple. And by now they have seen all these other things, these questions that he was coming up. And he wanted them to know that Jesus was not only the son of David as they were shouting when he was coming in on the triumphal entry, but he is also son of God. And he brought it up when he quoted David himself, when David was talking in Psalm 110. And he said, the Lord said to my Lord, come sit at the right hand. And they didn't understand that. They didn't really understand the fact that 
Jesus is not just here as the son of David coming in as a conquering king, but he is coming in as the king of kings. He conquers all, not only um, occupying forces, armies that are, are taking over Israel, but death, hell, and the grave. He conquers all, and he can do that for you. So, what's the point for this week? Jesus models what it means to live under the authority of God's word.